is a distinct honor and privilege to be here this morning. I, I've got to inform you, though, right up front, I am not Ron Malott, although, <laughs> although I'd like to grow up to be Ron Malott, but other than that, if I ever grow up, that's the question anyway, and it's a privilege to be here this morning. I spent a lot of time, no, I didn't, because I didn't find out I was coming until, but the time that I had, I began to think about what, what am I going to say this morning? And, and I thought of back to what's happened in the news lately and what we're dealing with and all that's happening in the news today. I'm thinking of the Paris uh, tragedy that happened there and, and the multiple shootings that have happened after that and, and uh, the, the tragedies that have occurred in a lot of different ways and the hard part of being this time of year and all the shopping and everything and the fearful part of not getting the right gift, right? No, not that. But I thought about, about fear. And, and I, I remember somebody saying one time that everybody's afraid of something. Oh, wow. So how do we as Christians, being human beings also, how do we deal with fear? And so let, join me in Psalms chapter 139. Psalms chapter 139. Let's talk about today, let's talk about what it means to deal with fear. And I'm going to tell you right up front, the answer to your question is Jesus. Let's try that again. The answer to your question is Jesus. Amen. Now we're going. Ah, good. Well, Psalms 139 begins to deal with, and the Psalms were, were the songs, the hymnal of that day, and all the songs they would sing would come out of the Psalms, and the written, they would read the poetry and that type of thing. And in Psalms chapter 139, down to the 17th verse, and I'm reading out of the New, uh, New American Standard today because I like the wording of it. Listen to this. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Let's pray. Father, I know the difficulties in our lives as Christians. I know the tragedies that all of us have faced, the heartache that all of us have faced in one form or another. I know that the fear uh, that is natured to the human being, and I know all that, but I also know that you care for us. Boy, you never leave us. You never forsake us. You promise that your spirit is with us. So help us understand a little bit more about that today as we look at your word and as we hear from you, we pray that in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Uh, let's start with childhood fears. I grew up on the eastern side of the state, and Little League there was actually called Corey League. Uh, George Corey started in St. Louis, started the Little Leagues there. And, and so I participated in the Little Leagues, and... and <clears throat> One of, the, one of the challenges I had playing baseball, and I had several of them, I was not a sports person, but one of the challenges I had in playing baseball was is I was afraid that they were going to hit me with a ball. So when you get up to bat, you know what you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be close enough to the plate. The coach kept yelling at me. He says, get up in the ball, in the plate. Get up in the box. And I would always stand away because I, you know, I was afraid I was going to get hit. And the fear, and then one day, God has a real sense of humor, right? <clears throat> one, one day, the, the guy that was playing catcher, you know that position, uh, he had to move. And nobody else wanted to be catcher, and I wanted to play, so I volunteered to be catcher. <laughs> you talk about fear, my word. And yet, God allowed me to overcome that fear, and I enjoyed it. Uh, my childhood, uh, those of you growing up in the 50s and 60s are going to hear about this and, and going to know, and you kids can ask them about it later. Um, you have tornado drills at school, right? 
uh, what do you do in a tornado drill? Go out in the hallway, you sit down, and you stay there until all clear is given. We didn't have tornado drills. We had bomb drills. It was the Cold War going on right then, and, and we, I expected to be a part of a nuclear war any time growing up. And so what did we do when a bomb drill? We would duck underneath our desk and put our head between our knees. And, and when a nuclear bomb comes, that's the only place you want to be, right? <laughs> that's going to help out a lot. I really felt safe. No, I didn't. <clears throat> we all have fears. You have to deal with your fears. And, and, and the best way, and I'm going to give you, you know, you ever write a, read a mystery novel and go to the last page, find out who done it? Well, I'm going to tell you who done it, okay? The very thoughts of a loving and merciful God, those thoughts are about you. Can you imagine? Later on, and I love it, in Isaiah chapter 49, God said he wrote our names on the palm of his hand. The very thoughts of God are for you. Now you know where I'm going, right? Let's talk about that, though, for a minute. <clears throat> Fears. First of all, the cause. There are physical threats. Children collect a vast sort of bumps and scars. I grew up on a 400-acre farm, and there were four of us boys, and, and I decided, I talked to my sister just recently, and we were wondering how we survived. All the things we did on that farm, and all the things we did were very unsafe, many of them. And how did we survive? I don't know. There are a lot of bumps and scars, and, and some of us as children, some of you as children, had bigger scars than some of the rest of us had. But there are a lot of physical threats to us, and now we can't even go to the theater, can we, without wondering if somebody's going to come in and shoot us. We can't go to the mall without wondering if somebody's going to do something to us. You ever left a mall late at night when everything was dark and most of the people were gone and walking to your car, you suddenly realize, hey, I'm all alone out here in the middle of this parking lot in a major city. Wonder what they're going to do to me tonight. There are a lot of physical threats, but also the ultimate physical threat, which is present throughout all life, is death. Living involves facing death. The writer of Hebrews speaks in the second chapter, verse 15, uh, those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong bondage. And you, if you've ever experienced true fear, know that fear binds you from anything. When you get fear, you have either fright or flight. You either freeze or you run away. But either way, you are bound by that fear. If you're living a life today of fear, let me tell you something. God has a way for you to be relieved of that fear. And the ultimate fear for the world today is death. Now, am I ready to go? I'm ready for death. But I say that I just know soon not be on the next load, right? Wouldn't you? <laughs> but somewhere along the way, we need to learn how to deal with the physical th fear of death. Those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong bondage. Relational threats. We certainly learn, this, learn that somebody can hurt us more than something can. Uh, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Wow, oh, right. That's misleading, isn't it? <laughs> How many times have you been just devastated by what somebody has said about you? As a young pastor, I came up on the first time that I found out somebody didn't like me just because of who I was, not because of what I'd done. That was devastating for a young pastor. Welcome to ministry, right? Right, Donnie? Welcome to ministry. You may not like the way I part my hair. 
You may not like the way I look. I'm sorry. I keep trying to convince my wife to stand up here and I'll preach from the back. <laughs> Those of you who know Linda, she's a lot better looking than I am. I thought I might get an amen on that one. So, The relational fears. I was so shy growing up. I mean, I really was. Um, I remember the one girl in high school that uh, let me take her on a date. She had sympathy on me. She really did. I mean, I was really shy. And the fear I had was the fear of no. That is, I was afraid that she wouldn't like me for who I was. I didn't like me for who I was. And the great fear is there that everybody else would agree with me. The great fear we have in relationships. That pulled over to my relationship with God. For I thought that I had to win God's approval. I was always afraid of lightning. Because I thought God was going to strike me down for some of the things I had done. Even as a child. I found out that my fears about God were not correct. And that, that God already knew who I was, and God already knew what I was doing, and God already had given me mercy and grace before the foundation of the world. The Bible says God had met my need. And my fears were all unfounded. But relational fears are very difficult. To love someone is to risk being rejected, and what greater pain is there in that? Fear of rejection keeps us from running the risk necessary if we are experience love. Listen to this. Fear of rejection led me to insecurity and shyness, and it bound me from being the person I could have been. Fear controlled me as a child and even into my teenage years. And I felt a little bit like Moses when he called me into the ministry. I said, God, I know you don't make mistakes, but this one you may have done. You have made a mistake in this one. And I didn't have a brother named Aaron, by the way, too. <laughs> but I've discovered over the years that God knew better than I did. Who knew? Because God provides there's spiritual threats, the threat of the unknown. The writer of Ecclesiastes saw death as the great unknown in Ecclesiastes 3. But at a simpler level, anticipating the first day of school or a blind date can be threatening. The threat of judgment paralyzes some people with fear. Why do some people never enter the, the door of this sanctuary? They do it because they are guilty and they know they're guilty and they don't like the fear of rejection and judgment, and so they will not be a part. You know, you all provide sometimes fear in people's lives. When they see Christ in you, they get fearful because they understand that fear is coming because God is going to judge them, and the conviction in their soul brings fear to their life, and they get frozen, and they don't want to be around you anymore because you're shining Jesus to them. Now, those of us who are believers, that's hard to believe. I said, Jesus loves them. Why would they reject that? Because they are fearful. And they are bound not only by their sin, but they are bound by their fear. Finally, and for you teenagers, this is probably your greatest fear. There is a fear or a threat of meaninglessness. If you go down the street, talk to teenagers. And ask them what they're, and if they're honest with you, and you ask them what their greatest fear is, some of them at least, if not all of them who are honest, will say, I want my life to mean something. I'm afraid that I'm going to have a meaningless less life. And that's a great fear. Viktor Frankl tells us in Man's Search for Meaning, this is the greatest threat to man, for man cannot live without a sense of meaning. Some people are traumatized by the fear that there is not enough meaning to life to support them. Anxiety, Carl Mickelson says, is the result of not knowing who you really are and to whom you really belong. So you come to the end of this life and you feel like your life has meant nothing. 
What do you fear? I fear the unknown. I fear the not knowing how. Now, I think I've said it here before, but I'm going to say it again. I, I've told my wife, if it's true, I want on my tombstone, he saw everybody with Jesus' eyes. Now, in a few years, hopefully uh, several years, <laughs> when I'm gone to be with the Lord, you can go look at my tomb and see whether or not my wife felt like that was true, right? <laughs> But I discovered that success doesn't mean anything. It's meaningless, really. I, I discovered, well, I haven't discovered, I've seen other people, and I found out money does not mean that much, right? But I found that I want my life to have meant something. And the only way that's going to happen is for me to allow Jesus Christ to love people through me. If I don't reflect His love and His meaning and His glory in this life, then my life really will not have meant anything. If I can't bring other people because of Christ coming into my life, if I can't shine His love and bring other people into the kingdom, then my life has no meaning. I don't care how popular or how successful or how rich I get. It doesn't matter. In a thousand years or a million years, it's not going to mean a thing. When I sing the last verse of Amazing Grace, some of you just know this already, when, I've been, when we've been there 10 billion years, I'm up to 10 billion years. When we've been there 10 billion years bright shining as the sun, We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Can you imagine? Seventy some odd years, the average lifespan of man today, compared to billions and billions of years, all eternity. Can you comprehend? I can't comprehend it. I, I always like to say, I, I'd like to make a, an appointment with you, get your calendars out. And in 20 billion years, we're going to meet on the west side of the throne. <laughs> we'll see how many of you come. <laughs> you hear what I'm saying, though? I wake up some mornings and wonder. Then I just have to remember the very thoughts of God were toward me. Can you comprehend? I can't comprehend a God who has cast the universe into place, who's created all things and all peoples. I cannot comprehend a God that loves me enough to even know my name, let alone very thoughts he has are for me and for you. I, I, I can show you that. Those of you who are going to heaven... When you get to heaven, ask Jesus what your name is. Ask Jesus who you are. Now, be ready for him to be brutally honest about that. <laughs> Remember Adam in the garden after they took the fruit? What did they do? Adam and Eve were afraid. And they hid from God. And what was God's question? Where are you, Adam? Oh, that's not the God I worship. My God knows where Adam is. And Adam knew that too. Adam realized that that question wasn't for God. That question was for Adam. Adam, think about what you're doing today. Think about what you're afraid of. Think about the way you're handling life. Think about the, the meaning of your life. The direction that you're taking now with Eve. You're, you're going to have to be cast out of the garden. You're going to have to go away. The walks in the cool of the garden are over for us. Adam, what were you thinking? Adam had great fear. They covered themselves with fig leaves. 
and they tried to adapt to a new life. And there was God, providing clothes and providing meaning for their life once again. Jeremiah 18 is one of my favorite passages. You know it as the potter's wheel. Remember the potter? Begins to mold that vessel and all of a sudden there's a bad clay in that vessel. And he pulls the bad clay out. Now, he no longer can make the vessel he intended because there's not enough clay in it. So the potter begins to remold that vessel into a new vessel. Right? If I was that pot, I'd be afraid. And, and I keep saying, you ought to be glad I'm not God because at that point I'd throw that clay away and got some new clay. If I would have been God, you wouldn't have lasted past Noah. I mean, it would all been over. <laughs> I'd start it over again. Aren't you glad I'm not God? I am. Uh, you are the potter. <laughs> I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will while I am waiting Yielded and still. Ah, I suddenly found the cure for fear. Being yielded and being still. Being still and knowing that God is the God that I worship. That I pray. The proper use of a plumb line assumes the world is in order, doesn't it? If the law of gravity is at work and it's continuing on, then everything will be plumb and will be level because the plumb line will hang directly down. But if the world does not act like God intended it to, then that plumb line gets off. Or if the carpenter pulls that plumb line all the way around, and misses the mark where it needs to be measured from, then he misses the mark, and it's not going to be a proper measurement. Now, I measure my life sometimes, but I move that plumb line all over the place. Because my standards are off base sometimes. And I get fearful about what's happening in the life. I went back to those 50s and early 60s when I was a child and we began to have all of the challenges of the Cold War. I knew that we were going to blow up. Sometimes I could not go to sleep at night because I knew that a nuclear bomb was coming to my home on my farm and was going to blow me to pieces. That's fear, especially for a child. I needed a cure for my fear. And you say, okay, Brother Jerry, you're not afraid anymore? Oh, yes, I am. I still get butterflies every time I stand up to speak. And tell you, I'm going to be honest today. My first sermon was May the 4th, 1969. I was 15 years old. Now, somebody want to figure out Bath major, do you want to figure out my age? <clears throat> God has a real sense of humor. At 15 years old, there was over 400 people in that service that day. And I was terrified. But a thing I learned in that, and over the years that I've been in the ministry, the thing I learned was, first of all, I, I don't care what you think of me. Yeah, I do, I do. But it's more important, the reason I still get butterflies when I speak is because I want to make sure what I say is not from me, but is from God. That's my fear today. That's my butterflies, my nervousness today. I want to know that I am doing and in the will of God and saying those things that praise God, but also is what he would uh, want us to say. I want to be hidden behind the cross. 
because His very thoughts are about me, I want to show you through my life that there is something about fear, but there's also something about the presence of God in your life that makes all the difference in the world to your life. So here's the cure for uh, fear. And you're probably going to be surprised at this word. But the word is power. The simplest cure to some fears is power. The small child, for example, who's afraid of trying to step across the stream will eventually grow out of that fear for he would be big enough to be able to walk across the stones. And that stream follows, uh, provides no fear for him or her anymore. Power, however, has a severe limitation as a solution to the problem of fear. Power can only cope with fear out of physical and relational threats. Power from you cannot deal with the spiritual threats. And when Paul penned those words, mankind began to have a fear. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, separation from God. That is a powerful fear that Paul related to us. We have a fear that, that when we end this life, and, and you know the current term is annihilationism. So many people believe today that at the end of this life, there's nothing more. We're annihilated and nothing else. Well, let me give you a good Hebrew word, hogwash. <laughs> For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, <laughs> that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. The power of the resurrection the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you're a believer today, that power lives in you. And, and Colossians 1.27 says, Christ in you is the hope of glory. That's the power of the resurrection living in you. That is the hope for any glory in this world. It's not just Christ, but He has chosen plan B. He has chosen plan B from the foundation of the world. He has chosen plan B to involve you and me. And that is that Christ living in us brings glory to Him in a sinful world. And the cure for fear comes as Christ lives in you. Second word is courage. I'd like to say courage is not the absence of fear, but doing what is right even when you're afraid. That's true courage. And we are not at the point where we as Christians are going to be in prison, at least this week, maybe. But I want to have the courage, that is, I'll be afraid. But I want to have the courage to stand up and do what I know is right, even in the face of my fears. For I know there's no other path than he's chosen the path through our hands to bring the glory of Christ to this world. And so I can't let my fear bind me. I have to open up my life and do what I know is right and good. Some people reach a state in life where they say, where saying to them, don't be afraid, is like saying to a person with cancer, get well. You can think your way out of it. No, you can't. You will be afraid. Anybody Star Wars fan? Right? Luke in the cave. Luke said, I'm not afraid. What did Yoda say? You will be. <laughs> well, I'm saying to you today, you say, I'm not going to be afraid. I'm quoting Yoda. You will be.
that I'm going to make a decision, like Joshua did in chapter 24 of his book, verse 15, it says, choose today whom you're going to serve. But he didn't stop there. He said, as for me and my house, just bought a cup this week. It says it on there. So I'm going to remind myself every time I take a sip of coffee, I'm going to remind myself, as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. Even when I'm afraid, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to serve the Lord. Even when it seems hopeless, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to serve the Lord. For I know the cure to my fears is the Spirit of Christ living through me. My fear of meaningless, my fear of heartache, my fear of you saying something bad about me. And I've had a lot of names called my way about me. None of them hurt, except for one time. I don't know why I'm telling this, but one time I had a group of church members come up and ask me why I didn't believe the Bible anymore. You talk about cut to the quick. Where did you hear that? Well, we heard it from our pastor. I, I know Brother Ron's going to probably watch this later, and so I'm going to say this, and I know Ron agrees with me. Whoever stands up here and speaks to you, test it by the Scripture. Don't just accept it. The, the great thing about being Southern Baptist is we believe in the priesthood of the believer. It doesn't matter what I say up here. If it does, it's contrary to the Scripture. And I know Ron Malott believes that too. Don't believe it. But test the spirits. Find out from the Word if what I am saying, what Brother Ron or Brother Donnie or anyone else up here is saying, test the spirits and find out if that's what the Word of God says. And then have the courage to overcome your fear by standing up and allowing the Spirit of Christ work through you even in the midst of your fear. That's courage. The, the third word, power, courage, and love. Unfortunately, I haven't found another word for that yet. This world has corrupted the word love. So let me try to explain to you what I mean by the word love. Love sometimes is 30, 365 times in the Bible we find fear not. And we find it there because God's love for us is more potent than any threat that can come our way. Love is patient. Love is kind. Remember 1 Corinthians 13? Love never has its own way. Wow. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane began to pray to his father. You know what his prayer was? If there's any other way but this cup, but this death, but this process, uh, but I'm ready. He said, not my will, but thine be done. I was 15, called to the ministry. The biggest struggle I had is, God, <laughs> this is not what I was thinking. Uh, I, I thought I, I looked for being on radio and television, and I did some of that work along the way. And, and uh, I, I loved to be in television production. I, and I was allowed by God to do that for a while. <clears throat> but I want to do that full time, all the time. But you come to the point where you understand that life has no meaning if you can't say, not my will, but thine be done. And you know what love is? Love is going to the cross for people who don't love you. Love is accepting God when you're still a sinner and not knowing whether or not He would accept you. <clears throat> love is loving people regardless of who they are. You know, one of the most potent verses in the Bible says that God is no respecter of persons. You may think you're a bigwig, you may think you're a pawn, you may think you're the lowliest place on earth. God is no respecter of persons. What he's done for me, he'll do for you. He'll provide that for you. I was, one of, one of the joys of my job, <clears throat> yeah, if you don't know, I'm an associational missionary, I work with churches in Clinton, Caldwell, and Ray counties. 
24 churches, of which this church is one of them. One of the joys I have <clears throat> is um, dealing with conflict in churches. And uh, I, was, I was teaching about the church in one church that was conflicted. I'm not going to tell you the name of it. But right in the middle of it, I could see that nobody was listening to me. And I, you know, I prayed and said, God, what am I going to do? And out of my mouth, without thinking, I said, you know, if it weren't for the Spirit of Christ, I wouldn't like some of you people. <laughs> Think about that a second. Where else but the church are we together when we wouldn't even like each other before? You know why that is? Christ looked beyond my fault and saw, yeah, I think in music all the time, Donnie, you know. He looked beyond my fault and saw my need. And can I do any less? You're a sinner just like I am. I can't complain about you because then I have to complain about myself. What is true love? True love is loving people through Christ's spirit in Christ's name. I can overcome fear if I just love people in Jesus' name. Just love them in there. <clears throat> the church, and we're going to talk about the community right now. The church is the community in which God's love is realized. Why are you here today? I trust that you're here because you believe in the body of of Jesus Christ that exists here in Lathrop at First Baptist Church and that you worship the God who loved you and gave himself for you. People come for different reasons, but I want to tell you about the community of love and why you should be here today. First John 3 verses 1 and 2 says, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us. Some, some translations say has lavished on us that we would be called the children of God and such we are. For this reason the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are the children of God and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when He appears... We will be like him because we will see him just as he is. Where else can you drive strength in numbers but here? Now, this building is not the church, is it? You are the church. Where else can you find your best friend, somebody that understands you as a believer, somebody that will care for you in the darkest days of your life, but the church of Jesus Christ here at Lathrop, we know as First Baptist Church. Where else can you find the love of Christ than through His people who have experienced that love and want to share that love with everybody around them, but here? Where else can I get enough strength to face this next week when I don't know what's going to happen this next week in my life, in your life. You know, they tell us that all of us have either experienced a tragedy, are currently experiencing one, or we're going to experience one. Isn't that confidence building for you? But that's the human condition. You can either live from heartache to heartache, or you can make a decision, not my will, but thine be done, and allow the love of Christ to strengthen other people as you are strengthened by other people, as the Spirit of Christ joins you together as the people of God in His church, His bride. Within the fellowship of the church, we are gifted with a radical new identity. We are the children of God. Well, one of the great stories Jesus ever told was a prodigal son. A whole new vision of what reconciliation, what redemption, what salvation is all about. The father didn't chastise his son. He adopted him back into the family. When the son says, I'm sorry, father, I've sinned against you and against heaven. That was the speech he got together, right? And there's nothing more exciting in today's world than when we are called the children of God. We're not merely the subjects of God's custody. We're not merely His creatures. We are God's children.
Then later on in 1 John chapter 4, John says this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him in this love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to also love one another. No one has seen God in any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. I want to be in perfect love. So even though in another sense, in another way, I may have never liked you. That's truly true, isn't it? I love you in Jesus' name. For he first loved me. And he died for me. Even though I did not deserve it. Last thing I want to tell you tonight, this morning. The church is the community that announces there is no Fear in love. You want know to, John says the opposite of fear is? First John is not bravery or courage. John says the opposite of fear is love. To the extent that we experience and accept both divine and human love, to that extent we are free from fear. In love then is fear's cure. The, in faith of Jesus Christ and in faith in Jesus Christ opens the door to a community of love in which the crisis of fear may be overcome in your life, in my life. Franklin Delano Roosevelt said the greatest enemy is fear. I think Adam would have agreed with that in the garden. I think growing up, I agreed with that. I think today, my greatest fear is fear itself. So how am I going to deal with my fear? I'm going to learn to love everybody in Jesus' name. I'm going to learn to love beyond myself. And I'm going to glorify Christ by allowing him to live in and through me. Am I going to be afraid again? Oh, yeah. Probably here in a little bit if it starts freezing on the road, right? I'm afraid that thing's going to pop again. (laughs) Brethren, Love one another as Christ first loved you. Would you stand? Every head bowed, every eye closed. No one looking around right now. I want you to have an encounter with Almighty God. I want you to talk to Him about your life and about your fears. So don't say I'm not afraid because we know the human condition. We're all afraid about something. But let's, let's, let's talk real here. Can we talk? Listen to God and hear from Him for He wants to relieve that fear in your life even today. He's already made the method, the cure possible through His Son Jesus Christ. Remember, He's already written your name on the palm of his hand. The very thoughts he's had has been thoughts about you, wanting you to overcome your fear. Allow him to do that today by the power of his spirit working in through your life. Father, open my eyes that I might see. Open my ears that I may hear. Open my heart that I may know that you love me and that I can have real meaning in this life. I'll just do it through Jesus Christ. 
We thank you for that. We thank you for that hope that we don't have to fear, don't have to live a life of bondage anymore. We can live a life where we stand up and say, I love you because Christ first loved me. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.